Each new life springs forth from a seed and is nurtured by time and destiny until it blossoms into a remarkable, unique miracle. When a father, the seed bearer, suffers the death of his child, his miracle, and his grief and mourning goes untreated, it can erupt into a debilitating rage, completely void of any resolution. This program is designed to enlighten you on the experience of the grieving father, to help you find the tools that will allow him to symbolically give wings to the soul of his departed angel, as well as give wings to his grief and mourning. The death of a child is a devastating thing. Whether through miscarriage, stillbirth, sudden infant death syndrome, or any tragedy that leaves a parent with empty arms, the emptiness never leaves. For the grieving father, frequently perceived as a parent scarcely in need of counseling and considerations following the loss of a child, much of the grieving and mourning is done in silence and self-imposed emotional isolation. Once our baby uh, girl was delivered, uh, we did spend about three hours with her. We held her. Um, and in my opinion, what has gotten through me is uh, I have a little sense of satisfaction knowing that I had a daughter, or I have a daughter. Her name is Madison Lee. Um, I've had a chance to hold her. Um, and that's something that no one could ever take from me. When he died, um, I became really numb. It didn't affect me until about probably six months to a year later. I didn't know what to do. I know my wife was really hurting and uh, she didn't think I maybe cared as much as she cared and that's just, it wasn't true. I, did, I do care and uh, I was hurting also. When Sorrell passed, no one was there who loved him. No one was there to hold his hand. No one was there to to touch his forehead. And um, I wake up every day knowing that. For so long, we've kind of looked at, you know, the woman's issues, the women's issues, the female's issues around the death of a child. But what we've not done is look, look at the male's issues, how men grieve differently from women. And so this program and this initiative and this video project that we're working on right now is really trying to explore some of those, those issues that have not been talked about and discussed. Grief is the, the emotions, all of the emotions that come from a loss, from being hurt and being in pain. The physical, the, the behavioral, the cognitive, things we think about, but mourning is what society lets us show. And so mourning is crying, uh, going to a funeral, planning things like that, having a baptism, keeping mementos. So they're very different things. The Empty Arms Support Group started in 1989 and we welcome mothers and fathers who have experienced any type of pregnancy loss, whether it's an ectopic pregnancy, a miscarriage, birth of, of a stillborn baby, or a baby who dies in the neonatal period. We meet twice a month for an hour and a half in a very informal, relaxed atmosphere. We let people have that chance to talk about what they're thinking and what they're feeling and the great part about that is they'll look across the room at someone who says I felt that way I didn't know anybody else thought that and so they see that they're not alone they're not so isolated and it's just really a healing thing men for so long we've been taught that we don't cry look at how we grew up you know girls play with dolls if a girl scraped her knee you know daddy would come and kiss it or mommy would come and kiss it you know she could cry that was considered to be normal and natural but if a young man cried or a young boy cried, it was like, you know, suck it up, be a man, you know, don't cry. And what we found is that, you know, as we go into adult years, even when men have situations where they should cry, where it's normal and natural, men don't cry. And so what we're going to do with this video is really kind of dig into some of those issues um, that men are dealing with around the area of grief, you know, regarding the death of a child particularly. While the experiences of the grieving father are certainly unique, there are many common threads that stitch together the circumstances of men who have suffered the loss of a child. Threads that create a compelling and revealing tapestry, a roadmap 
for health care, social service, bereavement, and hospice professionals that treat dads. Today, that roadmap has led us to the coastal city of Norfolk, Virginia, population 230,000. For five and one half months last year, Norfolk's population was increased by a very special little angel. Sorrell at three months was sitting up. He was holding his head up out the, um, holding his head up coming out the hospital, two days old. A strong boy. He was in the 95 percentile of growth. He was a healthy baby boy. Nothing wrong with him. He was a strong boy. That's why I call him my monster man. This was my middle linebacker. That morning, I can remember that morning, getting ready for work. Uh, Leah had already left for work. Sorrell was in the room on the bed sitting up. And he was just sitting there, just sitting there looking at me. I just saw him just sitting there looking at me. Usually he's all over the place. <laughs> but that day he was just sitting there looking at me. And my thing is, if I had stayed home that day, I wanted to, but if I had stayed home that day, just to, and it would have been he and I. It's a maybe. Customer service, Christian Smith speaking, may I help you? Oh, I work with, uh, in the computer industry. Mm -hmm. I'm a um, support specialist for Canon ITS. Mm -hmm. um, I hear people problems yes, every sir, day. I, I went to get them that day, and when I knocked on the door and the door was open, he was laying in the care provider's arms with his hand, with his arms sprawled out to the side, and he was not breathing. At that time, um, they started to do perform CPR on him. And the only thing that I could, the only thing that I could do was, I told myself, be calm. They're doing what they can. I can't help them in, right now to be calm and let them do what they had to do. So while they were performing CPR, I was trying to get hold of the paramedics. And I took two or three times. I'm not sure if I was cut off from them or I was hung up on, but uh, the lady that was on the four, at, at the 411, we had some words and um, I had a call back. Look, look, I just called somebody over there. They hung up on me. My child cannot breathe. My name is Christian Smith. I just told you my name is Christian Smith. Please send somebody over here. My child, he, he certainly comes. He's going to lip on me. Please bring somebody over here. Now, he can't, he's not breathing. So by the time that they got there, uh, I'm, being under the, uh, I guess, the illusion that once you put the child on the van or whoever has to go in the ambulance, the next of kin who's there on the scene, who knows the person, um, is allowed to get on and go to the hospital. But that wasn't the case that day. I was uh, harshly, verbally, uh, just, well, I'll say yelled at. And that's when the paramedic got physical and pushed me in the face, trying to get me out of the, get me out of the ambulance. And once he did that, um, I don't know what happened, but I grabbed him by the neck. Hey, hold on, my son, man. I started out being calm. I was very calm about it. I let them perform CPR before the ambulance got there. It's just the fact that you have a baby on this 
rig and the father comes up and says, that's why I lost it. When they tried to physically restore when they When he physically put his hand on me, that's when I lost it. For parents to be at the bedside during an emergent situation isn't always the best. And so emergency room personnel or paramedics very likely would try to, to remove the father and the mother from the scene so they can do their work. They need to remember to do that in a sensitive way, knowing that the parents are going out of their minds, that they can't do something for their child. Here is a perfect stranger who is caring for their child who seems to be dead or dying. They can't provide that same care. So just knowledge on the part of the medical personnel that this is what's going through a parent's mind and to try to take them aside in a gentle way and let them know we're doing all we can for your child right now and we need you to step aside so we can do that. We get men together and we have you know therapeutic sessions or we just have you know um, times we just talk about you know their interaction with services and oftentimes the service providers or the facilitator of a group will kind of think that the men are kind of kind of whining, you know, about being perceived as invisible, you know, by service providers. And many of them have gone to the places that these men have complained about and found out that um, you still have the same scenario, that um, men are perceived as being invisible. And I think one of the things that, as service providers, that we need to make sure that, again, that we uh, see men as being an intricate and very necessary part of the family in terms of um, rearing the children. But what can you tell us about the way men grieve? In my experience working with thousands of dads, what we've uh, uniquely noticed is that, you know, men take on that role of being a provider as well as the protector. And what we're finding is that oftentimes, you know, men want to be problem solvers, as I said earlier. And so this is a problem that occurred. You know, my child died. You know, I cannot solve that problem, but let me go into an environment where I can solve a problem. And that problem, that environment oftentimes is their work. We find a lot of men, how they deal with their problems, they go to work. They work overtime because that's an environment where they can be successful. And so what we're finding is that a lot of men tend to work a whole lot or engage in sports or in other activities where they can say, I have successful, I've solved a problem, whereas feeling helpless in the situation that we're talking about here. Are there inappropriate ways to grieve? It comes down to this old adage, you know, of things may not be good, but as long as I can feel good, that's what matters. And then that's it, you know, if I can feel good, things may not be going, you know, like they should be around me, you know. But if I can just feel good and kind of see things in a different light and not have to deal with the reality, let me take drugs, let me get into alcohol, let me ga engage in the serial relationships, you know, and I can feel good. It's very normal under circumstances that are unusual to take something that's used, that's worked for you in the past and overuse it, even alcohol someone who takes an occasional drink and, and they know that that relaxes them and makes them feel better in a circumstance where death has occurred may abuse that and, and not want to come down off like he said off of that high and, and so it escalates. They drink a little bit more and a little bit more because that feeling keeps coming back or it comes back sooner. So uh, it, it turns into a vicious cycle of, of abuse of whatever it was that helped them originally feel better. Early in the 20th century, one in 10 American babies died before their first birthday. During that same time period, the rate of infant mortality for minority children approached one in five. These numbers compare to what many third world countries are experiencing today. 22 years ago, um, my son's mother uh, had the child at six months. He weighed about two pounds. And at the time, um, children didn't make it with, at that birth weight. Fortunately, in the United States, pediatric medicine has enjoyed wondrous advances over the last 100 years. A recent federal report revealed that only seven out of every 1,000 babies did not survive the first year of life. Major medical miracles take place daily in advanced pediatric centers all over this nation. Yet to a father that has lost a child, reports of medical breakthroughs and positive statistics offer little comfort. From his perspective, he is all alone in the world, with not a family member, personal friend, or healthcare professional seeming to understand his emotional torment, his feelings of complete helplessness. One night can seem like a season of anguish. 
fleeting images of birthday celebrations that will never be. A faint voice calling out for daddy. A silent shadow of a child vanishing from within reach. Honey, are you okay? No, I'm fine, baby. Oh, I'm fine, I'm all right. Are you sure? Yeah, baby. No, I'm fine. Okay. See, I have to be strong for a family. I have a family that needs me. When I go to my daughter's resting place, uh, when I'm alone, it's hard. Um, I do cry, but me and my wife go there together, it's more of a, of a visitation. Uh, a lot of times I have to try and be kind of strong, you know, and I try and help and support my wife. Fathers are protectors of their children, and so no matter if it's an illness that happens to the child or death, fathers look at themselves as the one who should have been there to prevent that. They're ultimately responsible. So they, they will feel a sense of guilt, whether or not it was directly or indirectly related to anything they could have done. Have you uh, uh, considered counseling? I was told that I needed counseling. Um, my thing is that with counseling, I didn't think sitting down and talking to someone who didn't know me, who didn't know where I was coming from, my background, anything about me could help. I prayed to the Lord and I talked to my mother. She got me through a lot of it, even though she said I needed counseling too, but she got me through a lot of it. Your mother also told you that you needed counseling. Why do you think that, uh, that you're not doing that? You, you think that there is, uh, you really believe that there is no benefit to be derived? No, actually, I think I need to deal with, deal with it. It has to hit me. Why do you think any man would be resistant to counseling? I think it kind of goes back to the old uh, adage about men not crying, or men not needing help, the kind of the John Wayne, uh, Rocky mentality. You know, as, as young uh, children, you know, girls cry, you know, boys kind of suck it up. And I think what you're talking about here with regard to Christian is that, you know, he's trying to be that, that man, the man that he's supposed, he's supposed to be the provider, he's supposed to be the protector of his family. You know, if he needs emotional support, you know, you heal yourself. Whereas we have a, oftentimes perceiving that women should go and get counseling. And that's something that women and children do. You know, but men do not want, oftentimes want to sit around and talk about their problems. They want to solve their problems. He mentioned not wanting to go to a counselor who didn't know him, somebody who didn't know his background. So his feelings are still very fresh. It hasn't been a year. Uh, he, he may be holding on to those feelings in order to hold on to his son. Sometimes we don't release the pain because by holding on to that pain, there's still a part of that person with us. Sometimes I'll sit in the living room and a vision of him running instead of crawling will come to him on the floor. And I don't know if he's messing with me or, or he's just trying to say hi. And Sorrell was five months old when he died, yet Christian has images of his son walking across the floor. Is it unusual for a grieving parent to have visions of their lost children? It's not unusual at all. I've heard both mothers and fathers tell of having visions of their children. Uh, for example, I've heard a mother say, you know, my baby who died at birth, I had a vision of that baby talking to me and assuring me that everything was okay. Now we know that a newborn can't speak, but that's somehow speaking to them and it's a, it's a reassuring type of dream, if you will, that they want to believe everything is okay. 
And, and to see his son walk across the floor, he made references over and over to my strong boy. He was doing things before he was even supposed to be doing them developmentally. So that was, uh, that was his looking at a vision of what might have been, what should have been. And it probably was a comforting thing for him. When a father loses a child, family and friends, unaware of the magnitude of his pain and grief, can sometimes unwittingly cause greater emotional trauma by making comments designed to encourage and ease the burden. I fell down, I started talking to friends, and a lot of them, you know, some helped me out, some were just like, you know, they, you know, they felt bad, but it was just like, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. The anger that I recall, that I remember, was with my father, who I guess he thought he was helping me when he said, he said that it's really a blessing in disguise. And I didn't understand then nor now how could the, the death of a child be a blessing. But I think he was mostly referring to that, the fact that I was young, that you know, raising a child is really a difficult task. And I think he was speaking to that. But I became enraged with him for a very long time because you know, how could he tell me that the death of a child uh, was a blessing? When family or friends give advice at the time of a loss, for example, Leon's relative who said, this is a blessing in disguise, very often they are, find, they are looking for things that make them feel better, not necessarily the person they're trying to console. When people use cliches like it was for the best, uh, it was God's will, all, all of those standard things that we hear when someone passes, those are things that make, if I were to say them, they would make me feel better. But they're not going to help that person who's still trying to make sense of this senseless thing that happened. Um, I guess my advice to family and friends would be just to listen mm -hmm. and to be there and not try to make sense of it. There, there isn't any magic formula or magic words that you can say to make it any better. Yet, with proper counseling and well-considered emotional nurturing by family and friends, fathers do survive the loss of their children and move on to continue with their lives, knowing that the best way to give their own little angels wings is to give flight to their own grief and mourning. Basically, like um, I stated, um, that I do feel a lot of relief every time I do speak about the death of Sorrell. Um, from the last uh, camera interview that we did, as you, could, as you know, I was still holding a lot of guilt. And the more I look into it, the more I speak about it, the, the better I feel, uh, the more relieved or at ease I, can, uh, I feel. And it's like a healing. I had vision of him after that first meeting. But um, lately I haven't, not after the second, uh, the camera, the first camera interview. Um, to me it was kind of strange. You know, I felt like something was wrong. I felt like I was kind of forgetting about him. He was just there to remind me that, you know, he would always be there for him. He's free. He's not bound by um, the rules that we're bound by. He can soar wherever he wants to soar. He can help anyone he wants to help. Um, he's free, and one day I hope to be free and soar with him. Five and a half months after Sorrell Smith was born, night fell on a beautiful infant life in the city of Norfolk, Virginia, giving wings to heaven's newest angel. The project is part of the uh, Virginia Health Department's uh, Healthy Start Initiative um, to reduce uh, infant mortality in Virginia. And so this uh, video is a start in an effort to uh, educate social and health family providers about the issues that uh, men deal with around uh, grieving the death of a, a child. Um, and we're really trying to tap into those emotions and, and kind of tap into those uh, feelings that men have regarding uh, the grieving of a child versus how women respond to the death of a child. We've started about five years ago. There were approximately 12 programs that we knew of in the state that actually worked with our young men. And what we found out is that many of the projects that we had worked with, they were so-called family service agencies. 
But digging deeper, we found out that they were basically mother-child service agencies. They were not addressing the issues of the whole family, which included fathers. And so we've kind of seen that paradigm shift um, here in Virginia. And so what we have now are approximately about 80 programs. Those programs work with different aspects of fatherhood. One, obviously working with young boys um, to help them from becoming fathers prematurely, you know, before they have gotten a job, before they are married, before they can emotionally as well as economically support a family. Also, we have programs that work with our young men who are incarcerated, really trying to help them lead a responsible life and be a responsible role model for their young boys. Also, we have programs that work with new fathers, you know, helping them understand what they're getting into, you know, what they are about to enter into this adventure towards. Also, programs that are working with both mothers and fathers to help them to come to some type of agreement when there's some type of dispute, when there's a divorce and so forth, to help them to come to some type of agreement about what's in the best interest of the child. So we've approached this fatherhood issue from a lot of different aspects.